Pints with Jack, Season 3, Episode 47, After Hours with Dr. Diana Glyer, Part 2. Good morning and welcome back to Pints with Jack. As already mentioned, this is part two of the incredible interview, the last one we did with Dr. Diana Glyer. As I mentioned, it went deep and we didn't want to stop having a conversation, so we split it into two. So I hope you guys enjoy it. As a reminder, on the last one, we finished with Dr. Glyer sharing with us the influence that Tolkien had on Lewis from his spiritual journey of coming to Christianity, particularly the the true myth. So Lewis loved mythology, loved this idea of a God um, coming into existence and dying and rising again, but it was always myth. And it was only with the help of Tolkien that he realized that that was pointing to a true myth, and that's Christ and the resurrection. So that's where we finished. That's we're going to pick up here, and I'm just going to have this jump right into the conversation. And so, guys, enjoy part two of the conversation with Dr. Glyer. So, with the Inklings themselves, what are um, what are some other lesser known things about either the Inklings or works Lewis Tolkien that we might not be as familiar with? Um, hmm. <laughs> I think a lot of times when we think about the Inklings, we think about them as these uh, these these giants who had something very rare and unique and who found all that they needed for their creative process in each other. And one aspect of the Inklings I wish that more people understood was that they had a number of different groups over a long period of time. The Inklings wasn't everything. They didn't have all their eggs in that one basket. And that Mm -hmm. Inklings group, for what it's worth, wasn't just a critique group. It was also a group of people who encouraged one another, who created anticipation and interested audience for one another, who did give one another all kinds of support and advice. You know, the the process of uh, accomplishing a long, ongoing task, like Lord of the Rings, for example, uh, you need other people who can kind of help you to show you what that looks like. We talk about role modeling, right? So Warren Lewis, uh, C.S. Lewis's brother, was a member of the group, and he didn't start writing his books until after he'd been with these guys for a couple of years. He kind of sees how it works, uh, how a book gets written, how a book gets put together, and he says, you know, now that I've watched you guys do it, I think I, think I could do it too. And he ends up writing these wonderful history books uh, that are still uh, read and studied in colleges. Uh, they're they're really remarkable. So what I would say is try to um, think about the Inklings less as one group that had it all, and picture these guys going off in twos and threes to read each other's stuff, being part of other critique groups, other uh, settings where they got feedback on their ideas, uh, and also to recognize the sort of gentle process. There is no um, like official beginning date. Like nobody's got a gavel. Nobody says, and now we call the Inklings to order. They didn't even call themselves the Inklings until they'd already been meeting for several years. You know, there's all of these other things going on in their very busy lives. And I think that to soften the edges, if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. group and think about the ways that each one of them as a creative person was able to articulate what it was that they needed and was able to get what was available through the Inklings and the rest. There were spouses, there were friends, there were experts of various kinds that all spoke into this highly collaborative process. Speaking of that collaborative process, I'm assuming there are many listeners right now that are inspired by this and wanting to, in their own, to implement this in their own um, lives. What are some of the resources or materials or books they could read to just better understand this? There's a, a chapter in Bandersnatch called Doing What the Inklings Did, and that may be a good place to start. Sometimes people are shy about knowing how to start a group, and uh, one of the things that I say is grab a copy of Bandersnatch and grab a friend or, tru- or two and have a book discussion group. 
those are pretty low threat and yep. people like them. And uh, it has a good history in terms of the process of the Inklings to just sit around and talk about books and to ask questions and uh, make observations from the reading. There are two books on the creative process that I really like for people who want this sort of larger context, the Inklings uh, study for me opened up a whole world of studies of the creative process. And uh, I'd love a, a chance to talk about a couple of my favorites. Uh, for this book. One of them is a book called Powers of Two uh, by Joshua Wolf Schenk. And his um, story of looking at the creative process is a little bit like mine, except instead of starting with Lewis and Tolkien and their friendship, he starts with Lennon and McCartney and their musical collaboration. The way that two uh, individuals very unlike each other end up in this very dynamic dyad friendship uh, that's incredibly productive in terms of the work that they do. So Powers of Two talks about uh, the process musicians uh, go through as well as others and why two is the magic number when it comes to thinking about creative breakthrough. Uh, so I really recommend Powers of Two. Another book I absolutely love is a book called Creativity, Inc. Inc. And that is a inside peek at Disney and Pixar and the highly collaborative process that they go through when they're making a movie. And I love that. Uh, your listeners might find it interesting. There's all kinds of stuff online now that looks at uh, background and how different shows are created. I know that um, Lin-Manuel Miranda has done some great little videos on putting Moana together uh, here in the age of Hamilton. Remember that he wrote and actually sings on a number of the songs in Moana. But they they look, they give you a peek behind the scenes at the, the give and take the iron sharpening iron, the push and pull of the creative process among the musical uh, team that helped to put that together. But you've got a story team and you've got a visual team and all of these different threads come together. Creativity Inc. talks about that process in a remarkable way. Uh, and, and I think that thinking about a film is a great way to think about how a book comes together. It's just that in a film, we have the thing at the end that talks about the special assistant to the director and the grip and the best boy and the costume thing and the catering company, right? We have, we have all the names, mm -hmm. but if we could, every creative project that you can think of, every painting, every piece of music, every book should have a, 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 um, credits at the end that talk about all of these different people who made a tiny, tiny difference in the trajectory of that project. So we need each other as creative people, as people with dreams, as people with goals, whether we're gonna start a podcast or, or write a blog, whether you're gonna, gonna just put some songs together or whether you're gonna do something really, really extraordinary and extensive uh, we need other people involved every step of the way from the very beginning where we first go up to one another and we say, I have a brand new little idea. Do you think there's any merit, any value in it at all? To the point we're sometimes at more toward the end. You know, I'm, I'm coming to the end of a, of a long-term writing project. And I am telling you in a marathon, project like the one I'm working on right now, that last mile is really hard. It mm -hmm. is hard. It is so hard. I am dragging myself one day at a time toward the finish. I spent all day yesterday writing and I managed to produce two footnotes for a whole day. You know, that was it. That was all that I did. And yet wow. two footnotes yesterday, maybe it'll be one footnote today. Maybe tomorrow I'll, I'll revise one of the chapters. Uh, it's little by little, but I need other people to know that I'm in the, in the thick of it, in the midst of it, and I'm, I'm struggling along. So this creative process and the importance of involving others, uh, I live it, I believe in it, I encourage it. We need to do a better job of it, of understanding what are these different roles and what do we need and how can we get more uh, brave, more vulnerable, more active 
in including others in the process. You can hear, you can, you can tell you live it, you breathe it, you, it's, it's everything just in the way you speak about it, the passion, the, the, the grasp of it. You, it's just, it's, it's been a part of your process. Um, it's so beautiful to hear. So thank you for sharing all that. What about before asking a question on Lewis, bringing full circle, the inkling side of it, what? For, for some of our listeners who maybe are more familiar with Lewis and more familiar with Tolkien, if they were asking themselves, oh, I'd like to read uh, one of the other Inklings authors, what would be maybe a non-Lewis, non-Tolkien Inkling book that you think some people would appreciate? Um, something that came out of the Inklings? Yeah, one of the, yes. Okay, well, I would say um, what, one that, that's really fun is a book called Boxen that some of your listeners may know, but may not be as familiar with. And so one of the reasons that C.S. Lewis was so good at collaboration is that he was born into a collaborative family. So his brother, Warren Hamilton Lewis, is three years older. And so from the time that they were very small children, not only are they playing, but they're also creating. They're drawing pictures together. They're creating maps together. Eventually, they're creating characters together, you know, like kids do with the toys that they have. These become characters. The characters become stories. The thing is that for uh, Lewis and uh, for Jack Lewis and, and for Warney Lewis, for the two brothers, these stories get captured in drawings, in maps, in plays, in poems, and in different kinds of writings. And these have been published um, under the name Boxen, which was the name that they used for their invented world that brought together their uh, joint vision. So from the time that Lewis first decides to become a writer, an artist, a creator, he's doing it in collaboration with his brother. And so mm -hmm. Warren Lewis was a very important member of the Inklings. As I said before, he wrote uh, mostly history books, and his book, The Splendid Century, is awesome. Even if you hate history and don't really care very much about what's happening in France, uh, his writing is so perceptive uh, and so um, engaging that I think he's really worth uh, taking a look at. So Boxen is a good one for people who want to expand their understanding. The Splendid Century is a great one uh, by Warren Lewis. Can, can I tell you about um, a test that I give my students sometimes when I teach? <laughs> yes, <them>? please do. <laughs> so what I'll do sometimes is I'll take random passages from Warren Lewis and I'll take random passages from C.S. Lewis and I'll just put them on little cards and I'll ask the students to to, <laughs> uh, to tell me which ones are better written. No way. Way. <laughs> and every single time I've ever done this with undergrads, with high school students, with graduates, and at conferences with grown-ups, um, every single time Warren Lewis comes out ahead. Wow. Now, if Warren Lewis is a better writer than C.S. Lewis, if, if he is, then how come we're not ha having a podcast here called um, Pints with Warney? <laughs> <laughs> this needs to be an offshoot. <laughs> <laughs> it should be. I hope someone will do that because that would be great. Um, the, the thing you know what? We could do it once a month, and we, you and I will do this. Okay, here we go. Collaboration <laughs> at its Holding you to your holding you to your talk. At the birth of something new. Um, but here, here's the thing: I, I have to kind of agree. I do think that Warren Lewis is, in many ways, a better writer. He's more orderly. He's more personal. Uh, he, he's, he has a certain warmth in his writing, uh, that, that Jack, I think, uh, needs to develop or develops over time, but he didn't write about things that people deeply care about. And that's why we don't read him the way that we read his brother. What C.S. Lewis understood, uh, as, as Lewis said, is that which is not eternal is eternally out of date. That's an authentic quote, a real C.S. Lewis quote. <laughs> Uh, and so he was always looking for the underlying deeper questions and the deeper meanings. And that's why we're still reading him and learning so much from him, because he was not 
influenced by daily fads. He didn't get caught up in temporary controversies. When things happened, he asked himself, what are the underlying principles that will help us to unravel this problem? And that's where he planted his stake. That's where he, that's where he uh, did his best work. And that's why we're still reading him, even though at times, um, as Tolkien said, his prose is a little creaking and a little stiff, uh, and, uh, but he does get better at it. You know, a good example of that, uh, by the way, is mere Christianity. So I don't know if you know or if your listeners know that mere Christianity was an incredibly collaborative process. No, I, I personally had no idea. So uh, as you know, the mere Christianity is a collection of four sets of broadcasts that were given over the BBC. There's a wonderful book about that process, by the way, called C.S. Lewis at the BBC by Justin Phillips. And he talks about the process. So think about, again, the influence of others on that book that many people consider to be C.S. Lewis's masterpiece. So Lewis is going about his daily business. He's minding his own business. And someone reaches out to him and says, hey, would you be willing to do some broadcast talks? So the idea, the impulse does not come from deep within his soul, right? It comes uh -huh. from somebody else tapping him on the shoulder and saying, hey, would you consider doing this thing? Now, C.S. Lewis tended to say yes, unless he had a compelling reason to say no. When he was invited to do something, he felt it was part of his ministry to say yes and to do what he could. And this is wartime. And so he was eager to use whatever gifts and, and whatever platform God had provided to do his best. So what happens after that is a highly collaborative process. They ask him to do it. He says yes. They ask him what he'd like to talk about. They make some suggestions. He says, I don't like those. What about this? Okay, let's talk about that. Uh, and then he lays out the, the possibilities, the outlines the broadcasts. And then they go, eh, we don't like this, but we do like this. Then he drafts them. And the team at the BBC uh, give him blistering critique, voracious uh, suggestions. He has to write the whole thing. And then he gets the final script ready. And even at the very end, they, they make him come early. He has to run through the broadcast. And they're like, no, not that. No, not that. That's too long. Cut that down. Uh, and then he gives the broadcast and afterwards he gets letters from listeners and they say, I don't understand that part. I didn't like that part. That was a, not a helpful analogy. He looks at it and he starts to change the broadcasts week after week in response to the feedback that he's getting from listeners. And so you can read all of mere Christianity as a wonderful developmental process as Lewis is kind of getting his feet under him and more and more being able to communicate in a way that is clearer, simpler, and more compelling. If you look at the difference between the first book in mere Christianity and the third book in mere Christianity, and just read some sections out loud and ask to what extent is this connecting? How is he expressing this? It, it's really quite remarkable to see his development as a writer, just even in that one book. And so that's just an example of a book that again, the Inklings weren't involved with mere Christianity. It was other people who had uh, input into that. But what you see in Lewis is a kind of humility and openness to having others speak into his work. And that's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of incredible strength. That he has something important to say, and he wants to say it really, really well. And therefore, he's open to the most precise, picky feedback that he can possibly get. And that shapes not only the work he's working on at the moment, but it changes the way he thinks and the way he produces text as a writer. He's a wonderful example of that process. I never knew that. And my mind is blown. And you, you practically answered the question I was about to ask. Um, but I'm curious if there's any uh, a specific example. But 
what I was going to ask in that related to it was similar to the story you told in the beginning of that, the, the woman that stood up in your talk, because like for her, Lewis was superhuman. Like for me, Lewis, he's the reason I, I was an atheist for a bit and came back to Christianity because of C.S. Lewis. I will defend him to a T. Now I don't take any issue with him being influenced or anything like that. But for me, he has like a superhuman status sometimes. And sometimes it's easy to think like, oh, Lewis wrote this, so it's correct. And I'm curious, if this, even this right now, what you were just talking about of mere Christianity, I would have pictured him sitting down and one stream of thought because he's just so gifted, of course, and boom, he's got his pen and boom, it's done. And there it is. And it's amazing to hear that. So are there any examples in Lewis's from influences where like a book wouldn't have happened or he just really struggled through some processes um, that you came across in your writing, but because of other people or because of outside circumstances, it came together? Uh, almost all of the books that Lewis wrote, he wrote because there was an outside influence. So in writing, we talk about the difference between an internal prompt and an external prompt. So an internal prompt is when you wake up in the morning, you know, like you do, and uh, you're like, yeah, I really want to write a scholarly article that examines the close text of uh, mere Christianity comparing section one and section three, and you're just overwhelmed with passion for unfolding that particular difficulty. And then there are the kind of projects where your dean says you didn't have enough scholarly publications. You better get something out in the- <laughs> Or you're in trouble. And so you're like, yeah, that's an external prompt, right? Lewis wrote almost exclusively as a result of external prompts, even a book like The Problem of Pain, if you look at the introduction, right? Lewis confesses he didn't want to write it. Think about Tolkien. What happened when he was asked to write The Lord of the Rings? He said, I don't want to write it, you know? <laughs> And then he got talked into it, and then he decided to give it a shot. There are a lot of examples of that uh, in Lewis's life. Um, But the other thing about Lewis's writing process that I find so fascinating is that Lewis was an internal processor when it came to his creative work. And so he would get an idea for something, and he would sit on it for a really, really long time, sometimes decades before he'd actually start working, before he kind of could happen upon, he needed to happen upon the right form for it, the right language for it. He would kind of work that out in his head. We, we know this because we have a report uh, from a guy named Clifford Morris. Is that a name that's familiar to you? No. Uh, Clifford Morris was one of the people that Lewis relied upon to get rides places. So Lewis didn't like mm. to drive. And so he would get rides. And particularly after he had moved to Cambridge, uh, he needed someone to drive him back and forth to, uh, from Oxford to Cambridge and back again. So he had a driver, Clifford Morris, and it was often a fairly long drive, uh, an hour or two or more. And what Lewis would do in those rides, that he would compose things in his head. So let's say that he had a sermon to give or he had a talk uh, that he needed to give. He would sit and he would compose it in his head. And then he would say, hey, Morris, listen to this. And then he would recite a page or two that he had just composed in his head. And Morris would say, I like that. I didn't like that bit about the bird. Um, That middle section got a little bit draggy, you know, too long, too complicated. Uh, But I I did like where you landed. And Lewis would go, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, is this any better? And then he would recite the revised version. So by the time they got where he was going, he just sat down and he wrote in a fluid way. So what you're familiar with is actually true. When he actually came to write, he tended to kind of have it all worked out, right? But that's because he had this extraordinary ability and this incredibly retentive memory and could do these revisions in his head. But Isn't that a beautiful picture of what it means to involve other people in our process? If writing is supposed to be communication, we need to figure out, is the thing that I am saying intelligible to another person? If not, why am I saying it, right? Lewis understood this, that writing is transactional. The whole point is that the thing I'm thinking becomes the thing you're thinking, Um, Stephen King calls that the ultimate magic trick, right? That's what writers do. 
they have a thing they're thinking and they make you think it too. Uh, and so Lewis is involving other people uh, all, all along the way. So because other people invited him to write and because he involved other people every step of the way, we have Lewis as fundamentally a collaborative writer. Uh, you've been doing some reading, I think, of Till We Have Faces, and you've talked to some of the outstanding scholars uh, related to who, who have really put their live study into that book. And Till We Have Faces is a great example of a highly collaborative work, uh, one that Joy Davidman had significant input into from the time that the novel was conceived in a conversation between the two of them to the gift of anticipation as Lewis wrote a chapter, shared it with her, and they talked about it, talked about what was coming next, wrote the next chapter. Highly collaborative um, process, and her name should have been on that book. Uh, Lewis mm -hmm. wanted it to be, uh, in fact. And uh, so, so, yeah, when you think about Lewis, you want to think about somebody who, from childhood, was working in collaboration and who, right up until the very end of his life, was doing remarkable, open-handed, open-hearted collaboration with people he cared about. I love how, when I, I was not expecting, um, in this talk, I didn't realize this, how, how I'd learned so much about his collaborative side. Lewis seems to be incredible at taking feedback and honestly seeking it, desiring it. He doesn't seem to have much of a bandersnatch, to be honest, that's <laughs> flaring its head. <laughs> he seems to be much more humble and just, you know, oh, okay, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I love that. That is fantastic. Yeah, I, I know um, that we all would have that kind of openness and flexibility. And here's here's the thing. When, when we talk about that quality, it sounds like a really important spiritual virtue, but it doesn't sound like a very good creative virtue for some people. Like if I have a vision for a thing and then somebody tells me to do something different, uh, I want to listen. I do want to learn. I want to grow. I want to do better. But it doesn't mean automatically that I need to do what they said. So here's a couple of, of things that may be helpful for people who are working on projects of various kinds and they get some unwelcome advice. Uh, two thoughts. When someone tells me that there's a problem with a part of an article or a book that I'm writing, I want to take that seriously, even if their solution isn't the right solution. What they've done is they've identified a problem. And what I want to do is I want to look at why did they have problems with that part or that piece, right? Why did that woman who stood up and said, C.S. Lewis was a genius and didn't need any help, why did, why did she have a problem with the idea that Lewis was influenced? That helped me to think more deeply about why do we resist the accusation of influence? Why are we protective? We think we're not being original. We think we're being an echo or something of somebody else's work. We think our work isn't legitimate if we need help. That helped me a lot to think about how to reframe some of my description or discussion of how Lewis worked. D does that make sense? So oh, 100%. you don't drop it, but you say, aha, I can do a better job at making this more intelligible if I reframe this a little bit so that my listeners, so that my readers can understand it. So it's that kind of humility. But here's another thing. There have been a number of, of times, and I tell this story at the beginning of Bandersnatch, there have been a number of times where people have said, that's ridiculous, give it up, just drop it, you know? And, <laughs> and when I first started researching the Inklings and their influence, I had someone who took me aside someone I admired greatly who said, you are never going to find enough evidence to actually prove that these guys influenced each other. You know, here in the inner circle of Lewis scholars, we all know that they influenced each other, but there isn't enough concrete evidence. You're not going to be able to prove it. And, um, and this dear friend said, uh, I don't want to see someone like you throwing away your entire life chasing after something you're never going to find. Uh, that, that was a real 
hard moment for me because this was I was early in my in my scholarly career. This was somebody who uh, ha- I have enormous respect for, looked up to, uh, and and yet, see that was one of the great moments of um, clarity for me. His comment, his opposition, I talk about opposition in Bandersnatch and uh, also in The Company of the Keep. That opposition was really helpful for me. Having it come up early in my creative process, extremely helpful for me because I had to make a decision at that point. Uh, Am I in this or not? Am I, am I, is this a half-hearted thing or am I going to really go for it, right? And so at that point, you have to say, uh, am I in, you know? And, mm-hmm. and the gift of good opposition sometimes is not, okay, whatever you say. The gift of good opposition is, no, this matters. I'm going to dig deep. No holds barred. Uh, come what may. I am in. And uh, so here, 10, 20, 30 more years later, I'm in. Uh, This stuff really is important to me, and I really want to do it justice. And part of the reason I feel as passionately as I do is not only because of the way that collaboration has shaped my own process, but because at the very beginning, I had to make a decision to give this everything I got. I think the key thing that stuck out to me there Um, Because I've been in a lot of startup, more entrepreneurial type circumstances, both personally and professionally. When you said this matters, I find it's so important to, when when you're asking yourself, do you keep pushing on with it? Well, it's not, you don't ask yourself, is this going to be successful or not? Does it matter? And I think of Lewis's quote that I'm going to butcher, and I pray to God it is a Lewis quote. (laughs) But it's, it's, um, we're called to do what's right, um, not like what's successful and leave the rest up to God. Or something like that. And I remember David put that on our Instagram once and I saw it and I'm like, that's so true. My job is to figure out, is this right? Is this wrong? Should I be doing this? Does this matter? Not, is this going to be successful or not? That's up to God. I can't control that, but I can control doing what's right. So I love that. So thank you for sharing that story. Sure. As we bring this full circle here, wrap this up, um, we're doing Tolkien Month when this will be released. And so love to do quick little rapid fire fun quiz that we're doing with all of the the people that are um are the guests that we have on over this next month so tea or coffee coffee every time (laughs) elves or dwarves elves early bird or night owl neither one i'm kind of a late morning person okay gandalf or radagast i'm terrible with pronunciations (laughs) gandalf Call or text? Email. Email. I like that. Tom Bombadil, wonderful or wretched? So Tom Bombadil is wonderful, but he did not belong in the story that Peter Jackson wanted to tell. But he definitely is at the heart of the story that Tolkien wants to tell, a story of home. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Pippin or Mary? I have both. It's a dyad. Love it. Shilab or Nazgul? Nazgul are way scarier because they change. I like that. Second breakfast or Elevensies? Elevensies is a way of saying coffee, so I'm for the coffee break. Okay. Boromir or Faramir? Faramir is one of those honestly, um, genuinely good characters in literature that doesn't come across as sappy or sentimental. I think he is one of the great literary accomplishments of all time. Wow, that is high praise. I like that. Balrogs, wings or wingless? I don't think that Balrogs have wings, but I do think they can fly. Okay. Bagels or croissants? Bagels because you can put stuff on them easier. (laughs) <laughs> the movies or the book are you kidding me <laughs> <laughs> Dave, i'm gonna throw these on david <laughs> uh maybe the book arwen or eowyn am i saying that right eowyn eowyn would definitely be my choice because i think that tolkien does a better job of really drawing her as a well-rounded character rivendell or lothlorien 
I'm not going to answer that, but I will tell you that my last house was named Lothlorien. <laughs> Gollum or Jar Jar Binks? Oh, come on. Um, okay, so I, I, th- I think Gollum is sort of like uh, Charles Williams' character in the, in the book Descent into Hell. And I think Gollum is remarkable because what you see is something that Charles Williams loved to portray is someone who one small step, one small decision, one small step at a time becomes utterly corrupt. And that process was so fascinating to Charles Williams. And I think that he's captured in Gollum in a remarkable way. So I want someone who's listening, who's a really serious scholar to explore Gollum as a Charles Williams character in the context of the book Descent into Hell. I like that. That's actually the one um, Charles Williams books I've read. And then Tolkien or Lewis. Oh, <laughs> ask me that. So <laughs> the both. You got to have a dyad because the magic uh, occurs in what I like to call the transactional space in between the two personalities. I love how, because of your research on dyads, you're able to get your way out of those nicely. <laughs> Both the dyad. <laughs> <laughs> so now, briefly, um, I'd love to share a little bit about your other books. Uh, we have we've already talked about it, but Banner Snatch is the one that um, we tried to focus on here. But that's the more practical, popular version of the company they keep. So, who should read that one other than David? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Who should read Bandersnatch? Bandersnatch is for anyone who is intrigued by the creative process and the difference that that creative process might make to their own work. Uh, Bandersnatch was written um, because I had a student that just really wanted a book that cut to the chase in terms of trying to catch the dynamic interaction of Lewis and Tolkien, stayed focused on that, but also answered the so what question. So they edited each other's work. So they collaborated. So they captured each other as characters in each other's stories. Like, so what? And so that's the book that really emphasizes the why do these things matter and how might I take small steps toward making that part of my own life? Excellent. And who should read The Company They Keep? Um, The Company They Keep is an in-depth version of the mutual influence of all the Inklings. So people who want uh, not just a Lewis and Tolkien friendship kind of book, but a big picture uh, that really talks about the dynamic of all of the 19 members of the group. One reason to get Company They Keep is because it has an appendix in it written by my friend David Bratman that gives biographies of all of the different members of the groups and reading lists of what you might read uh, by these different members. And you see how different they are and how interesting all the members of the group were. Um, The uh, company they keep was written at a time when the idea of Inkling's influence was very controversial, uh, very controversial. And so people who want to hear in some uh, w- with some uh, emphasis, the the argument for influence and how it shifts our understanding of even the nature of influence would really like that. I'll also mention that um, the company they keep has more than 300 footnotes. So <laughs> just are enchanted by that level of nitty gritty detail, uh, things that I picked up along the way that were written in the margins or uh, found in a in a diary, those little obscure things. If you'd love that kind of stuff, uh, then uh, the company they keep is for you. I want to um, I want to emphasize. I don't think the company they keep is hard to read, right? It's not it's not that kind of a scholarly book, but it is uh, richly detailed. So um, Bandersnatch got written because I was teaching a class where, uh, we were using the company they keep as a textbook. And one of my students came up to me after class, uh, after we'd been studying the company they keep and said, uh, Dr. Glyer, you wrote company they keep as if you care about every single detail of the lives of these authors. And I said, yeah, I, I do. I do. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, well, not everybody does. And then she <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. 
<laughs> and of course, you know, my first reaction wasn't, why, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, I did pull one of those Tolkien things where you hear something and you're like, that's not, you know, ooh. and then you go home and you're like, huh, what kind of book would it be if I were going to write it for somebody who's like, I don't want all that. I don't want all that stuff. I just want the stories and the practical applications. And so I got a group of students together and I said, I want to rewrite the company they keep, but I want to change the tone. Uh, I want to change the purpose and I want to rethink the audience. And so they helped me to ruthlessly cut uh, the material down and then to rewrite the whole thing uh, in a way that had a really different tone. And I'm so excited because Bandersnatch is a book about collaboration. It was created in collaboration mm. with an extraordinary group, uh, an extraordinary team of students that worked with me week after week to teach me how to be a better writer. That's incredible. And if it's any endorsement for the company they keep for our listeners, David uh, told me a story of how him and his fiance, when this is released, they will be officially married, but are in a marriage prep course. And they're, they had to fill out this questionnaire or these, do these pre-questions. And one of them was, what's a phrase that your partner says frequently? And at the time, David was going through the company they keep. And so Marie writes and brings it. She does this independently into the marriage prep session. And it says, Diana Glyer rocks. <laughs> because da David kept saying that over and over because he's going through the company they keep. Um, and, and so she put that without like telling him, but it just, it came up. And so he died laughing. Absolutely. So that's endorsement to how awesome that book is. It won a lot of awards. It was a finalist for a Hugo Award, which was a tremendous wow. honor. That's incredible. And then the, the title that jumps out to me, Clay, in the potter's hands. That's just an incredible title, by the way. Thank you. So in addition to my Inklings work, I have other kinds of projects. And uh, Clay in the Potter's Hands came from my own work. I work on a potter's wheel. I am an artist. Uh, and as I was working with Clay, I realized that the stages that a potter goes through working with Clay have analogs or parallels to the way that God works in our life. And so it was interesting. Some of you may be familiar with a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. It's a classic old work that uh, is a discussion of the 23rd Psalm through the eyes of a shepherd. What I do is I take various scripture passages and I look at them through the eyes of a potter. So when you think of a potter working on a potter's wheel, you might think of the shaping process that the clay goes through. But I also want to emphasize in that book, uh, which is a devotional, um, the process that the potter goes through to find the clay in the first place, to seek it until it is found, to clean it up and prepare it for work. Um, we talk about the firing process. Uh, what does it mean to go through the fire? Interestingly enough, pots are shaped individually by the potter, but they go through the firing process together. What are the implications of that for our spiritual walk? And I talk in several chapters about what happens when something goes wrong in the process, when the pot falls over or when um, it gets dropped or chipped and how brokenness and seeming accidents are used by a good artist, a good potter, to in a way that's very redemptive. And so that's clay in the potter's hands. There's a workbook that goes uh, with it. And a lot of churches have used it for Sunday school classes. And uh, I recommend if people are interested in that component, they could look at clay in the potter's hands. Oh, that sounds incredible. David, just so you know, David bought it for his mother oh. a while back. <laughs> yes. So Diana, thank you so much for doing this with us. And where can listeners find out a little bit more about you? We'll put links in show notes, but I'm assuming they are going to be absolutely captivated by this. Where can they go to dive a little deeper? Well, I do have a website, uh, dianaglier.com. It is in the process of being updated, so it's a little clunky and stale at the moment. I hope that by the fall uh, I might uh, have some progress on that. I've also been toying with the idea of getting back into blogging, which I haven't done for a couple of years, but there have been a lot on my mind. These are interesting times, aren't they, with the mm -hmm. place and with the protests uh, 
and just seems to be so much going on in our world. And so I've been thinking about maybe doing a little bit of uh, blogging so they can keep an eye out on dianaglier.com. Uh, but I, I think what I would what I would really like is if readers might take a look at Amazon and take a peek at Bandersnatch, take a peek at the company they keep, and just read the reviews and look at it and try to decide which book of those two is kind of more up their alley, which one kind of fits uh, what they're interested in or meets what their needs might be right now. Um, and uh, I think that that would be a great place to start. Fantastic. And we also want to say before wrapping up a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters, our top tier ones, particularly Chris, John, Kate, Rowdy. You guys make this possible, help cover the editing costs. And uh, listeners, please join us next time when I'll be interviewing another special guest and we'll be going further up. And further in. Yes. Cheers. Thank you so much, Diana. Thanks. It's been great talking to you. <laughs>